Hi, and welcome to the Courtney Turner Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney, and I'm super passionate about moving and thinking. On this show, we are going to dive into all things health, fitness, personal development, lifestyle, and political sociocultural. I've always been fascinated by people, and I love learning from the experiences and stories of others. This has been a treat for me, and I hope this is enjoyable and useful for you. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or any way that I can make this a better experience for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Hello, welcome to the Courtney Turner Podcast. I am here today with my friend Max, who is a teacher. He teaches prep school, and he also does seminars in civics and history. How are you doing today, Max? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Courtney? I'm doing well, thanks. Well, thanks, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I'm super excited. So we are uh, under some pretty crazy times right now, would you say? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. I know it's been a very tumultuous period in American history. I, I, I you know, you, we've known each other for a while now and you know it. I'm, uh, I'm all over it and people keep reaching out to me and talking to me about it. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty dark. What did, what did, uh, what did Biden say? He called it the uh, dark winter or something like that, or the black times or the new middle ages or the dark yeah. ages. Maybe he should have called it the dark ages would have been better. I think maybe that's what he was trying to say, <laughs> but yeah, we are living in those times. Okay. Yep. That's yeah. Uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm about as far right wing as you can, as you can. Well, I mean, reasonably yet. I mean, reasonably, I don't want to say not that. An anarchistic, but you're definitely no. pretty far right. You're yeah, exactly. Conservative. Yeah. So yeah. were you always that way or did, you know, is this something that developed in your studies or? Um, yeah, right. So that, good question. So um, it all started for me uh, when I was a kid and I remember, you know, growing up and Newt Gingrich was the speaker of the house and I really, I, I thought he was, um, I, I looked at him as sort of being, I, I mean, you know, the, I've heard about the Reagan era and all that, but I think with, with Newt, um, he was just this dynamic figure. I couldn't vote uh, for him or anything, but I, I just looked at him because he was a historian and he had this dynamic personality and he was a great debater and I had a lot of respect for him. So yeah, I've, and I've, ch- I've I know I've, I've talked publicly about that before to several people. And I've mentioned at the seminars, I know I've mentioned it there too. And yeah, that was, that was the beginning of it. And I grew up in a, in a very uh, conservative household and um, you know, just very um, you know, just very uh, well, they, my family went back in during the, the, uh, I would say the golden age during the uh, greatest generation when world war II era, um, they were FDR supporters, but they migrated, if you would, with their politics further right, uh, Pat, when we got into the sixties after the Kennedy, uh, era. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, I, I kind of had that background, uh, but my family was always blue collar and stuff, but still had these social conservative, um, you know, foundation, if you would. And, uh, that's, that's how it all, be- that's how it all began. It's just growing up in that house. But then for me personally, it was really, I just liked Newt. I agreed with his policies and everything. And I, and I said, oh, you know, I'm going to be a Republican. And, um, that's, that's how that began, uh, you know, with that. So as far as my, po- you know, how that mates with, or I reconcile that with my education, it's the same question I had in a different way when I decided to take archeology, span cause I was essentially becoming an anthropologist and, you know, my family's very religious and it was, how do you reconcile your faith with scientific? And anal- it's easy for me, actually. I, I don't really have a problem with that. Um, that's a probably, I don't know. <laughs> that's a, that's a big topic, but. Uh, no, I, you I'd know. be very curious to hear because people yeah. seem to think they can't coexist. And that's so bizarre to me because when you look at, you know, certainly the emergence of the scientific era, they very much coexisted and people did not see them as being separate at all. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the, the thing is really it comes to make, like all things in life. I feel that it's basically it was root. Any problems you're having is rooted in a misunderstanding or an ignorance. Um, if you don't believe that, just spend some time with me on Twitter, which I know you do. <laughs> Anyways, just just spend some time with me on Twitter. Whenever you're getting trolled or something, it's usually just a lot of ignorance, a massive amount of it. Yeah. And so, um, and it's it's I, there's only so much you can do. And I, how many times can you explain yourself or explain something in in in, in different ways? And, and somebody just whether they want to understand it or accept it. And uh, I, that's something that's a uh, that's how I, I one of my ways of approaching life. So when it comes to like when you're dealing with 
say uh, the origins of uh, well, when you, let's let's say when you're talking about the age of the Earth, which is one of the biggest things. Uh, you know, as an archaeologist, yeah, I'll sit here and I can discuss with you the fact that the last ice age ended twelve thousand years ago, right? And um, but as a Christian, you have to sit here and you go, wait a minute, the Earth was created in four thousand and four BC. It doesn't actually say that in the scripture. Uh, we come to those conclusions because we we rely on the chronologies in the scripture. We we just string all the years together every time and we add it up and we go well the earth is six thousand years old approximately uh actually creation uh is is you can you go back to adam yeah adam and eve you can say that was six thousand roughly six thousand years ago mm -hmm. uh if you're using the biblical chronology but the earth is much older than older than that and that's the thing the, the bible doesn't actually say that the earth was made six thousand years ago uh the for the words in genesis 1 1 to genesis 1 2 actually genesis 1 1 and genesis 1 2 genesis 1 1 in the beginning god created the heavens the earth genesis 1 2 is and the earth became without a form and void and darkness covered the earth. Um, if you take the English and you go back into the original Hebrew, the phrase in Genesis 1-2 is actually a past tense verb, and it became, it doesn't say and it was, it actually translates everywhere else in the scripture, and it became formless and void, and darkness co you know, covered the earth. It changes the entire meaning. So, you know, when you think about it, think about it from this perspective too, when God creates something, he creates it perfect. Why would he create something that's formless and void? So I already started getting into this when I was in college too, because of course, all my professors were secular and, and top notch in their field. Um, fortunately, they were all very open and to debate and conversation. So when I was taking, um, I was forced to take a certain amount of evolution and a certain amount of, I had a lot of prehistory, which is prehistoric history, you can go all the way back hundreds of thousands of years to the Paleolithic period, you know. So I started actually just formulating my own theories. And it's, it's I don't say it's my theories. There's actually um, uh, people, off, some people know it's called gap theory, you know, you, in Christian or Christiology, uh, theology, essentially. So if you like go from Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, and if you believe there was a time uh, something went on between the, the the actual creation of the universe and then the Lord saying this, this, and that happened. Um, that there was this, there was this, there was this gap of time that, that, you know, in time immemorial, we don't actually know how long it was. That's called gap theory. And yes, it, there, it's called gap theory. That's true. But it fits perfect, explains a lot. If you allow for that, it also makes God look a lot bigger to me because then I start thinking, well, then there were other creations that went on because then there are other scriptures that allude to it. You know, you read in Ezekiel where Satan or Lucifer actually was walking in Eden, uh, not the garden, in Eden itself, which is a, a, a regional place biblically. Publicly. And so he's walking around and, and, and he's a prince over all these people. When the heck did that happen? It uh, didn't happen at any time in the last 6,000 years. He was already a, he was a serpent in the garden. And then the Lord says, oh, I mean, he put the garden in the east of Eden. So you start going to yourself, hmm, okay, well, wait a minute, Eden was already here. They're just these subtle things that are very passive that indicate that there must have been something that went, there was another time before our time as, as, as humans. And then you say, well, okay, well, what about all these bones they find and everything? Well, that, I, you know, to me, evolution's a joke. I mean, biological evolution is a joke. I, I always thought it was silly. It, it, if you listen to really any smart mathematician, mm -hmm. um, I can't think of, and maybe you know him because you, I know how educated you are. Um, but yeah, there's a, there was a mathematician a number of years ago that used to debate this issue. He's a secular Jew. And, he, and I thought it was brilliant the way he was much more articulate than me. <clears throat> Excuse me. He, I remember him talking about how the, the, the material record, um, there isn't much to it, first of all, as far as, uh, uh, as, far as our, our ancient quote unquote ancestors. Um, but you can't, make, you can't make anything of it. That's true. You really can't. You make a bunch of assumptions based on a few bits of bone and you draw these conclusions that in some way we evolved. But the thing that gets me is the, num the probability that something that is a fish, essentially, something very small is going to evolve into a, a land-based creature as sophisticated and complex as we are, I mean, you might as well go out. It's it, well, it, you're talking about trillions to one that that's going to happen. It's like taking a, it's like taking a Volkswagen and and trying to make it into a submarine. It's even it's harder than that. So I, I you know, these mathematically, it's silly, it's stupid, it's preposterous. But most people in the scientific community won't say that, even though they a lot of I believe a lot of them think that personally because they're afraid. Um, 
for being basically canceled out politically, if you want to use the modern expression, which is as as a as an educator, I understand that, and so they keep their mouth shut. But the thing is, uh, you know, whenever I hear of, of consensus in the scientific community, that's a political term. Consensus is a political term. There's not. There's never consensus in science. It's always that's evolving. Society evolves. The people's opinions evolve. But biologically. I mean, yeah, why, you know, I want to be, I'm going to just like be very layman about it. And I know a lot of people would, I would totally um, relate with me on this. Mm -hmm. If, if evolution's true, why aren't we still witnessing it? It's in some degree, somewhere, someplace biologically, but that's the way, but you know, it's just that coming in from this perspective and yes, I'm a Christian and everything, but I was able to actually express myself and debate with students and with professors yeah. and reconcile. And, you know, I made, I made my arguments and that's where it's at. And I left it there. Um, but at the same time, it's easy for me too, because it frees me up to saying, Hey, you know, once I start coming from this idea and I say, they, they, they cause they label you right away. You're, you're a Christian. The earth's not 6,000 years old. And I go, you're right. I say to them, it's not. And they get confused. I said, have you ever read the Bible? Well, no, not really. Go read it. In fact, get it in Hebrew and start translating the words for yourself. That's the original language of the old Testament. You get the, they get the Masoretic text. And, you know, and I, I give them the, the ISBN number to a good copy. And, and I say, and here, here's some, get the Strong's Concordance and get, you know, some good thesauruses and, and you're set to go and you're an educator and, and, and start doing your own homework on it and tell me if you think that's what it really says in those verses. And, and I start handing them a bunch. And you know, like I said, you can, you can do this throughout the entire Old Testament. There's, these, there's a lot of passive indicators in there that just suggest the earth is much older and people read over it. They just like, they do this and in, in, like, you can get me into theology. That's a whole nother field of mine. Um, I have my own opinions on that too, even in the New Testament and and stuff. But um, yeah, so yeah, I was able to reconcile it, and I have pastors in my family, and uh, so I we would sit down and 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 I would you know debate church history with them. But I'm, we always come from the same fundamental background: Jesus Christ is Lord, and and I I never sacrifice that. And yet I'm an archaeologist. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a weird paradox. Huh? So no, I'm yeah. sorry, I went on and on and on. I, I just, I took over your show for a second. And that was awesome. That That's why you're here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta remember, this is not my podcast. So yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I asked yeah. and I wanted yeah. the full yeah. answer. I'm yeah. very curious. Have you read, there was an article I saw was a couple of months ago about how scientists had traced all human life back to one man and one woman. Yeah, you know, I have read that. And you know what? They actually, um, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't know. I wonder what their names were. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I have, I remember, well, you know, here's another one for you. I don't know if you know this, but going back several years, uh -huh. there was, um, at least in, in uh, biological evolution, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a, um, there was actually a, uh, there is an Eve. So they do, they do, they do trace it back. There's out of Africa theory that we all go back to Africa in right. some way. And, um, I, I don't subscribe to that theory. I think there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of, there's a lot of archeologists that don't, uh, there's a lot to do. Um, there's a, a lot of debate going back and forth on that. Uh, of course, I, I, I believe the fertile crescent was the origin of civilization. It certainly was the origin of, um, of, of literate civilizations, historical civilizations, uh, Mesopotamia, specifically, um, the, you know, the breadbasket of society. Uh, that was uh, the, the or, well, there's, an, there's a debate raging. It doesn't rage really, but there is a, you can make an argument that who, who developed written languages first? Um, was it the Egyptians or was it uh, the uh, Mesopotamians, Sumerians. And it, it was probably, it's hard to say, but between 3400 uh, to 3300 BC, somewhere in, around there, it was the earliest written languages. So when we say civilization, it's sort of like um, you're implying a, a literate civil, civilization from a Western point or Western centric point of view, but there are other civilizations that are older. And uh, so, you know, that's the way I look at it. But uh, I digress. The, the, um, uh, the thing is, there was a, a, a who was the first mother, and they call her Eve. They actually did dub her Eve in in evolutionary biology, and I mean, we're we're talking. They go back, you know, some some uh, million years, well, you know, or some. I I I I don't know if it was one point five million years or something like that. Again, that area of of prehistory is not my my forte, but it, it's they and they do this trace through. Um, uh, DNA. So they go, they trace it all yeah. the way back and that's where they do a lot of it from. Right. Yeah. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious 
So I think you were talking about how, as an archaeologist, like a lot of your professors were secular. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think we're seeing that that's, that tra trajectory very much so. <laughs> There's a secularization, certainly in this country. But I think even throughout the West, we're seeing a lot of that. How do you think that that has impacted uh, the political and sociocultural climate? You mean as far as the professors being secular, how did that impact not, them? Not just professors, but in general, I think that we're seeing a secularization. I don't think it's just in academia, but I think certainly, I, so I, I guess I could ask you twofold. What do you think about it in academia and how do you feel about it throughout our, our culture? Well, I think in academia, it's a crime. Um, that was largely caused by, by the way, and I'll just give you a cause in effect. Um, that was largely caused by uh, conservatives, specifically, uh, I would say, Christians, whether they were uh, Catholic or Protestant, uh, ceding that ground over decades, uh, academia, to uh, to people on the far left. And this is that's been going on for a century. Uh, you can go back as early as the early uh, 1900s, the early 20th century. Um, when public education was starting to really become prolific, uh, er, the early um, academic leaders, most of them were, a lot of them were very, the ones that were, you know, pioneers, quote unquote, were, were liberals. Uh, they were, you know, by our standards, they would probably be more conservative, but by their standards, they were pretty, pretty secular and pretty liber liberal. Um, and I think it's, it's a terrible thing because the children, uh, especially in public education, which reaches far more children than private education, uh, it had a negative impact. Uh, I'm not saying that in of itself, if you had a liberal education in some way, uh, you're going to automatically become a, a liberal or a Dem registered Democrat. And, and we've already seen in, in our lifetimes, right, uh, that uh, as people get older, they, they tend to move further to the right. Donald Trump, for instance, uh, you know, getting most of the votes. Oh, what, did, uh, what did Churchill say? You know, if you're under 30 and you're on the left, then it you, yep. no, sorry, if you're on the if you're under thirty and you're on the right, then you have no no heart. And if you're over thirty and you're on the left, then you have no brain. That's right. And there there's more proof uh, about how uh, he was again, a person who was a student of history. And yes, he understood that from his up from observations and from knowing history. You move to you get more conservative as you mellow as you get older. You're supposed to. Some people get more liberal. Those are actually the anomalies. Those are the exceptions to the rule. But that happens too. But um, you know the uh, I think it's been a terrible thing, and as a terrible impact it forces us to actually have to um you know <laughs> re-educate people and and you know and it's it's a it's some but you know at the same time i think though for me it it you know getting hit by a lot of people who um did think differently than me open my expanded my my opinions of things like i was saying at the seminar you know that you attended uh over the uh, last week um you know the the fact is that uh post-structuralism and structuralism and all these different philosophical points, which I know you also very familiar with, mm -hmm. these different modern philosophies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy that I got to go through archaeological theory, that I took social theory, that I, that I, that I studied um, some sociology, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I, I, even though it's secular, it's very humanistic, it helped explain in the natural, at least, things to me. So I was able to put them in perspective, and, and I actually could understand uh, the other side's uh, uh, thinking. Uh, you know, of course, the, one of the most obvious ones is the fact, and I do consider myself more post-structuralist. I didn't even say that the other night in the seminar, I know, but I do consider myself as an archaeologist, more post-structural uh, uh, position, um, which, you know, I, I take the position of like, you know what, it's it's up to the perspective of the individual, because as I say all the time, everything is subjective, nothing is objective. And I tell my students that sometimes, mm -hmm. and it throws people off. Now, I'm I, as a Christian, I believe there are absolutes. Uh, but if we're talking, if we're talking about humans, it, everyone is, if we're talking about human knowledge, it's very subjective. I'm not talking about spiritual knowledge. So this and, is very interesting because uh, Nietzsche actually said this as well. He said that, you know, everything is open to interpretation and people mm -hmm. think that he, that he was a forerunner for postmodernism because he mm -hmm. said that, which yeah. couldn't be further from the truth because nowhere does he ever deny that there are absolute truths. He absolutely believes that there are. That doesn't mean that human beings are always capable of knowing the absolute truth. No, it doesn't. That's because we're finite creatures trying to understand the infinite. And exactly. so, 
you know, right? So, so that, you know, I, I just sit back and, and so if I'm speaking with, and, and again, it being a human, I'm, I mean, we, I believe we have spirits and, 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 and souls, um, which I do differentiate. I do, uh, I do believe these are two different uh, aspects of our characters and our beings, but we're living in a physical world. And so, you know, we are interrelating with other people physical beings and so you know i mean unless jesus himself physically is walking amongst us which he did two thousand years ago beyond that or the of the early apostles who were all anointed uh by him uh beyond that i mean you know you're, you're dealing with other humans who are subjective finite and therefore you can't possibly know everything you can't possibly you're not we're not omnipotent we're not omniscient we're not uh, you know and so people are prone we're, we make mistakes right that's common sense and uh, so therefore, you know, when you're touching knowledge, I just believe people are, you know, inherently subjective. So yeah, it doesn't mean that you're wrong. I'm wrong. You're wrong. We could be right on that thing. But it is open for interpretation. You can't ever be 1000% certain. The only thing I could say, like, like, uh, like some, uh, some, uh, some people I knew once say, I, I, I I remember I used to grow up in, um, I grew up in a household where everybody was, there was all different generations, right? It's a very Latin household. So I, I remember they would say, the old timers would say to me, um, you know, only two things are, 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 are definite in life, death and taxes. So, you know, that's, that's the only <laughs> absolute in the, in the, yeah, ta you can't avoid taxes while you're living. You're definitely going to die. So that's just, that's all you can, that's all you can, you can, but you actually can avoid taxes if you don't pay, if you don't work and you know, you, but then, you know, you yeah, know we'll that's, that's a lot of that. <laughs> I would, I would yeah. say probably the only two things that are inescapable are suffering and death. That, mm -hmm. that would, that would be. That's a better way. Hey, that's very good. That's very good. And you can, yeah, that's a good way we're looking at it. Um, yeah, to go back, circle back. I'm going to use the word circle back because that's the popular, the word, trendy word right now, right? Um, yeah, you know, to get back to that uh, other point, you mean uh, when you said we're talking to me, I think you were saying about um, beyond academia, you're saying larger society has secularism yeah. and human. Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, uh, one of my biggest things is I'm a declinist. So I, I tend to look at, um, that's just my term, by the way, I <laughs> just call, I don't know if, I honestly don't know if, if people call themselves that, but I think things are in decline inherently. So while I'm very positive and upbeat, uh, and I, and I project that to a lot of people because that's who I am. I, I also am very much, I believe that society, especially Western civilization is declining. So um, you know, Euro America is sort of slowly in decline and history shows that. So one of the things that I think has hastened it or, or contributed to it heavily is the fact that we have moved away, uh, broadly speaking, uh, not, not universally, but broadly speaking, uh, in society, especially with the major institutions from our Judeo-Christian heritage, which I know is been talked about since before I was born, right? They were saying that this was going on and that we were moved, we were becoming more liberal. I mean, really, if you go back all the way back to the 60s, you can, you know, people were saying that and in one degree or another, and, and I'm certain you can go back 100 years and hear people talking about, yeah, things are getting bad. Um, but we, you know, we are, I mean, I think that the, the, in the past, there was more reverence for the church and the church's positions. I think there was people, families were more intact. Of course, the family unit is disintegrating, which is a huge contributor to our, our social problems and our economic problems actually too. Yep. And, um, you know, all of that is, 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 uh, is like, yeah. And then you can trace it all the way back to the fact that people are abandoning their Judeo Christian heritage, which isn't surprising when you consider for, I mean, you can, you could see, you just look at Hollywood, Hollywood's sort of like a reflection, right? They tend to say they're, they're the reflection of what society's like. They're actually accurate in that. I think that if you look at Hollywood from the thirties and the forties, and then you compare it to the fifties and the sixties and compare that to the, to the seventies and the eighties, and then to what's going on today, and you can see it just a steady decline right. and um, you know, in society from one generation uh, to another and, and people, you know, when you go back and you say, okay, well, what would happen? Well, what happened was people, you know, pretty much you, you remove God and you remove Christianity uh, for public schools, you remove them from the workplace. You basically make it a crime virtually to speak publicly about your faith. I mean, evangelicals and 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 traditional Catholics want to go out and they want to talk about their faith, even even Orthodox Jews, and they're either shut down, their churches are now closed. I mean, just the, the attack is unreal. You can see video. I mean, I don't know if you've seen it in New York, of of police officers going to Orthodox Jewish homes when they're having Havdalah services, which take place after the Sabbath. And so, you know, all of this is going on, and uh, and it's almost like you know, what the heck's going? Why are these? Why are are these religious? Uh, fundamentalist groups from these different great religions 
uh, monotheistic religions being targeted. Right. Um, I, and, and that's, that is the, where we've come to. The next thing that's going to happen is they're just going to, I mean, they're going to find ways of charging you with crimes. And I think we're starting to see indications of, I mean, this may sound paranoid or, I, and it's not meant to be because everybody who knows me knows I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I, I hate conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I just, I avoided them for, I just don't agree with them. And, and uh, I won't even talk about them even casually. I, I mean, you know, but I have a lot of people that, you know, they're, they're big believers in certain right wing conspiracy theories. Uh, and I'm not, I've never been, but um, you know, it's, it's uh, what's going on in Silicon Valley. And I've talked about this a lot. I know with the censorship is a first step in that direction to where, you know, basically if they, you know, if they can't put you in jail, they're going to shut you down and, and turn off your microphones and silence you. And they're not going to let you have a venue to speak publicly and they control the public uh, venue, which is the form, the open conversational forms, which are online. These are these yep. either whether it's uh, Twitter, whether it's YouTube, whatever. Um, they're they're controlling it, and that's our that's what we use for that's a public forum today. That's where you know in ancient times you used to go in, in Greece, you'd go to the agora and you would speak publicly in Rome. You'd go to the forum and you would speak publicly. Today we use online. We're doing what we do here on a, on at the on these social media sites. So you know, but yeah, it's definitely Christianity. Uh, the decline of when people lose their religion, they lose they lose a huge part of their identity, and then they don't know who they are anymore. And they need that kind of stability in society. Even if you weren't a church going Christian, or you weren't you didn't go to your mosque, or you didn't go to your synagogue every uh, every Sabbath, um, still you subscribe to some universal basic truths. You know, the Ten Commandments yep. being up on the wall, people would just subscribe to that. Yep. You know, and that's why they believe in something greater than yourself. Absolutely. All yeah. beings need that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I, um, yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm <laughs> monopolizing. I'm sorry. I'm monopolizing your podcast and I'm I going know. out <laughs> becoming a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I asked you yeah. a question. You're giving me very thorough answers, which I greatly appreciate. No um, I, I would absolutely agree. I think that, you know, to, in, from my perspective, it's, not just the, uh, you know, decline of like certainly the identity and yes, the family structure. Um, I, I think there's also, you know, the core values that, mm -hmm. you know, our, our founding fathers certainly, and this, you know, like I said, they extend to the West. I think when you talk about America, there are certain unique aspects. And then there's obviously we drew so much from Western civilization as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. But we are the only nation that is, you know, one nation individual under God. So mm -hmm. I, I think that there's our founding fathers recognize that, that, you know, when you're talking about uh, understanding that we're humans, we're, li we're limited. And, and you talked about your, uh, you know, liberal arts uh, education, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And how much you appreciated that, I think, because it gave you a sense of humanity and that it is relevant. And I think it absolutely is. One of the things that I find so brilliant about our founding fathers was the fact that they really understood human nature. And it's one of the things that I see, and then I'll circle back to use that phrase again. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, they really, it's, they really understood human nature. And I think it's one of the big differences between the left and the right is that, you know, the right typically understands that human nature is inherently flawed, um, but that, you know, they, so, and they're not, but they, they're also very good and they're capable of tremendous good. And so they want to structure a society that recognizes there's evil within each of us. And how do we, protect the society as a whole you know from that from the problems that arise from that but it's not that we're going to fix human beings whereas i think the left typically looks at the job of government or you know societal structures to fix humanity mm -hmm. uh, and i think that is kind of a fundamental worldview difference but what so with that you know uh, as a foundation for what i'm going to say next I think that our founding fathers really understood humanity. And so they really did understand that human beings all have, we all have darkness within each of us. And yep. that in order for a free society, and that's what they valued, you know, they, these were people who really had everything and were willing to risk it all because liberty meant more to them. And they knew that e even in a free society where you have liberties, that you, it only worked if you had the checks and balances of a moral foundation. And that's why the Judeo-Christian values were woven into the fabric 
of our founding documents. And I think the fact that we, you know, they, they very much stressed the, you know, it's freedom of and from religion. So you didn't have to believe, you know, and you could choose to believe in whatever you wanted to believe, but it was really important that that moral foundation was there as a checks and balances to, you know, some of the, the deadly sins that we all have a tendency towards if, if tempted enough, you know, and had enough freedom toward to, yeah. 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 And, you know, and, and the founder, there was some universal, you're absolutely right. There were some universal truths that they applied. I mean, you think about it, Thomas Jefferson was a true deist. Um, he basically, people say he wrote his own Bible. Um, he, 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 he cut it down and, and eliminated the miracles and a lot of the spiritual aspects to some moral basic truths. I, I mean, of course, I wouldn't uh, do that and I wouldn't recommend doing that. But he was, a different, he was a different person. He was much more liberal. I know I've talked about this again in my seminars. And, um, you know, uh, but when you compare him to somebody like John Adams, who was a dead, by our standards, he would have been considered more of like almost like an evangelical uh, Christian. He was a fundamentalist. Yeah. Um, and these two were, uh, you know, uh, you know, these major pillars of the of the American Revolution and, and, and the, you know, the, fa the founding of our nation. They're two of the greatest founding fathers. I think John Adams is often overlooked um, because he was a one term president. And there was controversy. It's funny, people don't even know. This. There's a lot of controversy to his election and his reelection because uh, you know, the, of the election of 1796 and 1800. But, um, you know, and, and a lot of people don't know also that Jefferson was his vice president, which is hilarious. Uh, that's sort of like having uh, Trump have uh, be the vice president to Biden, I guess, in many ways. But, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, these are, the, the founders had different, they had diversity there. I think there were, I, I don't know if there, I can't even remember now if there was, uh, uh, do you remember if it was 55 or 57 members to the continental of the uh, continental congress i or I, I don't remember exactly the hot, the number but i think i think there was all of them were, were protestant except for three that were catholic three or four of them were catholic and uh, and then you had the deists um but you know they 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 had these uni like you said they had universal truths and values that they subscribed to which anchors a civilization and what happens is eventually as will durant wrote extensively on and i highly recommend Anyone that listens to your broadcast, I always say this to students. I say this, to, you know, to to adults, any age bracket of of a person of student I have. Read the story of civilization. It's a tremendous set of books on uh, by Will Durant. It's a little uh, dated by our by our times because he wrote it in the thirties and twenties, thirties and forties. But uh, he talks a lot about how. Um, what is his famous quote? You know, a, a civil, a great civilization isn't conquered from without until it's destroyed itself from within. So, you know, what does that tell us about it? What is it specifically people's morals, their mores, actually their values, they are abandoned in the case of Rome. This is where he wrote that, that quote, that, that in the epilogue of, of Caesar and Christ, he was referencing Rome, but you can apply it to a number of civilizations. I think, uh, Mel Gibson used it at the opening of his movie, his uh, Apocalypto in 2006, which had to do with the Maya civilization. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and in the case of that movie, it was dealing with the post-classical Maya uh, civilization uh, from the Yucatan Peninsula. That's specifically the setting of the movie, uh, which, but, but the, the Maya civilization was already in decline. And so, and by the way, just, and I always love to tell people this, and tell students this, that there are Maya living today. There's a, there's a few million of them actually living, um, modern Maya that actually live in, uh, in Guatemala, but, and in the surrounding areas. Um, but you know, they, uh, you know, these, these people, um, these different civilizations again, had, they had a moral compass and when they abandoned that compass, they literally got lost. And the United States is no different. When I say the United States, it's because we're the largest, right? We're the most powerful. We're the last superpower on earth. And we sort of bookend the last 2000 years of history, you know, first to Rome, and then you can just go all trace it all the way up to the United States, which is the pinnacle, really Western civilization is the peak of, of, of human history um, for, you know, when it comes to this, this, I should say this generation of Western civilization, this period of time we're living in, uh, if you want to say um, Anglo America or Euro America is the peak of human, uh, of human development. And I'm not talking about, I'm not saying this to put down other parts of the world, but it's the, because of the age of exploration, because of the, because of the conquest, frankly, if we're being frank about it, because of the way we exported, um, you know, whether it was our, our religions, we exported our languages, everything from Spanish to English, 
uh, to even Portuguese because of the customs. And a lot of it, in a lot of those, those things we've exported, whether it was through mostly through Great Britain and Spain and Portugal, but also other countries, a lot of them have their roots in classical um, education, well, I can say classical education, but the classical arts in the classical world. And so in a sense, Greco-Roman history uh, has, because of the Renaissance and whatnot, has been then disseminated through these these uh, these these European powers over the last 500 years, mm. and they and they you know they just they it's it's been disseminated to all these different parts of the world, and so you have whether you know I mean if you just, you can go whether you go from China all the way to the to the Middle East, there's you can see the stamp of Europe and America on all these different civilizations, all these different, these different cultures, and so you know um, but. Again, I say Western civilization is in decline primarily because the United States, uh, before it Great Britain, um, they, it, 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 they are, we are slowly, whether it's economically, with socially, whether it's uh, politically, we are slowly on a trajectory downwards. Not, and, and we get these resurgences. We have these revivals, if you would, um, whether it's the Reagan era, whether it's the Trump era. If you go back further, you could say it was the Nixon period. Now, when Nixon won in 72, everyone thought it was like, this was unbelievable because he was, well, actually he won in 68 and he got, was going to promise to get us out of Vietnam. And in 72, the massive landslide he won by 49 states, it's rivaled only by Ronald Reagan's reelection in 84. I mean, no one could have foreseen within two and a half years he would be resigning from office so you know this is but there are these periods these the, that was a repudiation his law and order campaign in 72 of the far left and and the entire uh leftist free speech movement out of out of the uh, uh that that was making a home for itself in the democratic party the anti-war movement particularly and and the riots and everything that was going on so you know but we go through these periods of revival and we're slowly though the trajectory in my opinion is downward the problem is after like i pointed out um at, at the seminar again after after uh, after the united states what's what comes next there is no other western power you know the great right. britain based yeah great great britain declined and, and and we took over their mantle you know as the world policemen so so I have two questions. You, Go ahead. I had one before and then you- Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I went on and on and on. No, no I don't. Don't be sorry at all. So my, uh, my first question is, so looking throughout history and because you say that we are in a decline, which it, it does seem that, that that is certainly a possibility. Yeah. So what could we learn from other fallen civilizations and how could we do or do you think that we could possibly- uh, slow the decline or, you know, if there's any hope to reverse the decline. Um, so that's my first question. And uh, then my second question is, so it'll be two part and then I'll let you just talk and talk. Yeah. It. Um, <laughs> the second question would be, you know, because I, I happen to agree, I think, you know, we are the last frontier. I think that we are the, you know, the, the helm for the free will of humanity and, mm -hmm. it, you know, when we go, the rest of the world goes. So what does that mean for the world and certainly the free world and for humanity as a whole? Well, I'll answer your your uh, your second question first. Um, I'll say when we go, uh, I, I, I don't know. We've we've we have been there as as in, in again, when and I often talk about Western civilization again, it's my this is my area where I speak. My spent it's the part of history I love the most, which is kind of funny because then, of course, you know, I I have a, an affinity and a and a great love for um you know Asian uh, history and a spe specifically uh, Korean and and Japanese history and actually Chinese history too. But I mean, my ex I would say probably if I have to say expertise and I put that in quotes because I'm not an expert in it. But um you know if I if if I, I like uh, medieval and Edo period uh, Japan. Um, but, you know, and, and we're, again, we're talking about great civilizations. I've like Mesoamerica, we're talking about, uh, uh pre-Columbian, uh, Western hemisphere, if you would, uh, the pre-Columbian Americas, we're talking about the Aztecs and the Maya, which were outstanding civilizations, definitely rival Rome. The Inca absolutely could, could in, in South America could, could rival Rome. Um, they, I mean, think about it. Here's a civilization that had no written language by, so, you know, by our standards, they were prehistorical in a sense, yet they had a, a sophisticated highway system and they could transport goods 
over long distances of, of uh, you know, for we're talking hundreds of miles within days. So this is a very, um, these are very, uh, and they had a tremendous, all of these cultures had outstanding uh, masonry and building and architectural uh, uh, engineering skills beyond our, uh, beyond, how I think about it, it's like people go, how did they build the pyramids without bulldozers or without modern machinery? Well, I said, you know, yeah go go to go how did the you know how did the inca do what they did without iron tools without metal tools i mean you know you just you have to start you know, asking yourself uh these questions these were these were very advanced uh, uh people they certainly yeah. but you know when you when you think about because of the whatever the reasons were and it's largely because of conquest right and and there's no getting around it um the uh european civilizations the european cultures the countries um, you know, they, they bear the responsibility of having conquered, uh, all, a lot of different parts of the world and, and, and therefore, but when that happens, they inadvertently or, or deliberately export their culture and put their, their cultural fingerprint on another civilization. Sure. And that needs to be studied and that needs to be discussed in every, every serious history class and archeological class, in my opinion. But, um, I think when uh, we go, I mean, there is a um, there the closest uh, parallel to that. I can say uh, would probably be, I would say, Rome, the Western Roman Empire falling specifically, yeah. and it never really it didn't it did fall. I, I I I disagree with some of the more modern historians. I know they're great people and and they dominate the field, but some of them believe that well, the United well, you know, Rome did not really. Uh, fall in the West on a particular date. It kind of cult the culture continued, and and I said, yeah, I go, but there was no the Senate wasn't really operating anymore, and there was no more emperors, and the the uh, Germanic tribes that were um uh, the Goths that were actually occupying uh, the Ostrogoths uh, that were occupying Italy, and they set up a monarchy. This wasn't this wasn't the em the Roman Empire, quote unquote, anymore. It was something other, you know, and and so that's. Uh, it, it's it does uh, there's a little iffy there when you do that but yeah the, there was still roman culture continuing but that's about what happened in the rest of western europe over the, the fifth actually throughout the fifth sixth seventh century western europe pretty much just fell into and, and they don't like using the expression anymore but to 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 paraphrase biden the dark ages a dark ages is what fell on them for a lot of reasons you call it that primarily because there was no universal lingua franca that was unifying the the continent anymore which was latin latin was only learned now uh by priests it was where it was maintained mm -hmm. um if you were wealthy and you were a nobleman you could afford to have your child educated mm -hmm. uh, illiteracy went through the roof um, there were so, so many different dialects of Germanic tongues that were being spoken all over Western Europe. The highway system fell into disrepair and disuse. I mean, this was this was a bad time. The aqueducts, which were bringing in fresh water all over the empire, were suddenly no longer being used. Um, I mean, essentially, if you were an Italian in the seventh century living in Italy, uh, you were looking up at these architectural wonders. If you were in Rome, wondering who were these people that built these things? How did they manage to get the finances to, to, and, and the manpower to put this together? To what, what is the what is the Colosseum even used for? They, they didn't even have a knowledge of it in many cases. So this was a really this was decline. Then of course uh, there was an increase in pestilence. There was an increase in plagues. I'm using the old fashioned terms. Um, the, the sewage system was a critical part that was no longer being, not, not every, not every Roman city had these things, mind you, but a lot of them did. And so, you know, with that came increased disease and, and, you know, uh, you know, sickness. And then of course there wasn't an, the birth rate dropped off precipitously. Uh, that that's for a variety of reasons. A lot of times there was a lot more stillborn births, but like in any civilization, any part of the world, anytime you're living, if there's, if there's not enough medicine and doctors, and nutrition rates are low, you're going to have, you possibly are going to have infant mortality. So there's a lot of that. And then of course, that's going to contribute to what? Well, then the, the adults, um, when they don't grow up to be adults, they can't work on farms. And again, no. you know, the, the most people could do is actually farm for themselves. So in Rome, the height of the empire, the major R Roman cities were actually uh, importing uh, grain and food from different parts of the empire. All of that was stopped. You know, I mean, the breadbasket of like Egypt, where they had a lot of grain brought, all of that stopped. And so Western Europe pretty much was just, a, uh, the population just decreased and people were living 
uh, just to and barely try, in some cases, not in every case, it's hit or miss depending on where you're at, but they were just trying to survive their, their life. And it wasn't, you know, this was a, this was a really bleak time in many ways. There were a lot of positives too. Um, when, when you get it to the eight, like for instance, 800, you get to the period of Charlemagne and this resurgence and basically a renaissance of, of Roman culture in a German kingdom. But, um, you know, there, there are these, so there's this, again, there's this back and forth that goes on. And so if you ask me what happens when, uh, if, if, if we're, and I don't believe it's going to happen in our lifetime, but I'll, I'll, I'll actually come back to that in a moment. First, I'll say, if you can ask me what's going to happen after the United States is not here, if the United States is not here, I would say to you that it would likely fall, we would fall into a neo-dark age, a neo-medieval period. I mean, and then would, that's what it would amount to. Think about, um, and if people want to get a good view of how I view it, and it's, it's again, a, I like to do this. I like to use, I always use movies in my classes. Mm -hmm. um, I reference them. I would say, think of, I wouldn't say Mad Max. I think that's kind of like way out there, but I, you could, you could say a little bit like Mad Max, but a good movie that's underrated in my opinion, but it's kind of long. I can see why people, some people didn't like it is the postman with uh, Kevin Costner. I think that oh, that actually great movie. post apocalyptic. Yeah, it is a great movie, right? It's a good post apocalyptic movie. Yeah. It gives you a feeling of like, what if the United States just disintegrated? Not really a war where like you see Mad Max, it's a post-apocalyptic world in the sense that there's been a major nuclear conflict and people are just trying to survive, but a little a little more like something we could relate with, like a catastrophe happen. Uh, there's no centralized government. And, this, and essentially, forget about the states, the cities and the communities just boarded themselves up, build walls, and they're acting like it's the 1800s and they're living on the frontier again in the, in the American West. And that's how it is, like a neo-Western, neo-Old West movie. And that's the setting. And I, I think that is more, unless there is a major war or something that's kind of see i see where things could it would it, it's you're talking about now social degradation so that's going to inevitably lead to a collapse in 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 the in the political structure and that's what you have i think going we're on. already seeing that you know the yes we are yeah and what was the and, and, I, and the I, other and question I, just, was is yeah. there any and then i i now have another one but before i get to my second <laughs> question um okay. what are uh, things that looking through uh, history are there things that we can learn from those fallen uh, civilizations and try and either slow down this decline or reverse it possibly yeah i i would say the first thing is i would tell people to kind of have a come to jesus moment and you have to you, you look um spiritual revivals and this is again some you know Heck, Protestant Reformation his Reformation history. You don't even have to qualify it with Protestant because there was there was the Reformation and there was the Counter Reformation from the Catholic Church, and all of this has to be studied. This isn't even taught in most schools anymore. Mm -hmm. So you know when when I I just and I and I've taught at some really top classical schools, and I can't believe when parents sending these kids with these tuitions, and I and I've told old, old we're talking about older students now. I'm not talking about fifth graders or something. And they still don't understand or have a knowledge about it. And I think, and that's scary. And I've had students that, um, we're, we're, again, now we're talking about college students, okay? We're talking about that um, they're getting these educations. And they, I think some, I hate to say it's, I don't want to say it's the teacher's fault or the school's fault only. And I think that they largely to blame. I think sometimes the curriculums are boring, but I'm going to tell you some of these, or we have a, we have a whole group of young people coming up that are somewhat younger. Of course, they're younger than me. And uh, they are, uh, uh, they have no interest uh, and they have, they have an entire, I'm going to say they have an entitled, a lot of them have an entitlement mentality and we're, I'm not, they're not necessarily left-wingers. They could be from right-wing families and they have, I, very few of them have an interest. Some of them do. Some of them have, uh, are, are, you know, for, I can't, I'm, I'm, how would I put it? They have a very, they have a large appetite, you know, and, and, uh, for, for knowledge, but a lot of them don't. And, uh, I don't know if that's, I, I want to say that's, every generation has that to some degree, but, you know, I, I just feel like it's, it's getting worse. I think they have, they have moment, they just have like this instant gratification. So they want to be on their phones all the time. They want to be on their, they figure I don't need to know that I can look it up online. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't make them scholars and they don't even have a clue what scholarship is. And so, you know, if we, if we look at it, like when, what are we going to do? What can we do about this? Well, I think if we look at the, and I, and I did digress a bit, but if we look at the fact that 
we need a come to Jesus moment. We need this, 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 this revival in society. Revivals took place throughout the 19th century in the Ameri in the United States. They took place throughout the early, in the, throughout the, especially the first half of the 20th century, all the way down to the Billy Graham revivals and into the Oral Roberts and all of them. And you know, this was all going. Something happened in the in the 50s and 60s, and people started. Uh, just there wasn't any movement of the church. The church has been kind of bland. And we have this, in my opinion, and I don't want to become too churchy here with your audience, but we have this thing where you know we have these mega churches and whatnot. I don't I don't know. This is this is just me, but I don't know if these pastors, they may have 40 or 50,000 people that attend their church. If you have that many people that are really into scripture and they're really, I mean, you should have great debates and conversations about doctrine and that should be what's permeating uh, public discourse because you see when you have that many people that are are conversational, if you would, on biblical truths, and and they're debating, which you should have robust debates on these topics. The, the disciples have learn how to think instead of what to think. Exactly, <laughs> and then you won't have. I mean, the, it'll have a positive impact, in my opinion, mm -hmm. on the larger secular society. It just does. If you if you don't believe that, look at Hollywood in the '30s and '34. They passed the Hayes Code. Well, the Hayes Code was just their way of censoring themselves because they didn't want to run afoul of the church. When I say the church now, I'm speaking broadly. I'm not talking about any specific church, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just larger Christian movement. They didn't want to run afoul of it. Mm -hmm. they, knew, they knew, and they knew that their opinion, what, what, what Christians thought about their movies was going to impact their budget. And so they didn't want to, they didn't want to get anyone angry. So they, they kept, uh, they, they, they kept a tight leash um, on, you know, on all these actors and, and, and the films that they produced, they made sure that they actually censored them. They self-censored. And, uh, then you think of that. And then you think about what happens from 67, 68 forward. And when they abandoned the Hayes code and they put the rating system in and then, you know, but again, Hollywood abandoned that because society became more liberal and abandoned its Christian roots. I would say to people, you know, they, they should pray <laughs> for a revival. That's one thing I, if they don't, and I often like to tweet about, I did this a lot during the election. Um, if you pray, pray. And if you don't, maybe you should start. I tell people that, but you know, it does. It, here's another thing too. I would say to you, another thing I would say is we have to get back to serious classical education. When I say classical too, is I'm not just talking about sitting around talking about um, Aristotle and Plato all day. I mean, you know, that's not necessarily what I mean. But Although like, I, I think that would be gr a great start. <laughs> it would be a great start. I do. You know, just if you can imagine young people debating those topics, they're not going to have time to sit around and they wouldn't care what Beyonce says or they wouldn't care what you know. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, who the, they, who the Kardashians, they just wouldn't have time for any of that. Um, can you imagine if young people were in, in, in they, I know they like to do their little chat rooms and whatnot, if they were sitting around chatting about, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the meaning of life basically and the better way to live. And, you well, know, if they and, actually had a foundation in Aristotle, they would have a foundation in how to live and how to think about difficult questions and difficult issues. And that, that's really what the, those you know ancient philosophers talked about so it's it would be really and, yeah you know it's true and the fact is this um you know people um you know people don't necessarily appreciate uh the importance of classical education in the way people you know and, and they're thinking and they or they tend to think well classical education is something that um, you know, it is, is stuffed shirt and it's this or that. It's not, it's, it's, it can be, a, it can be, it's something that can be very, I think it can be very relatable to young people and it can be very relatable. That's how I teach. So that's how I teach when I teach though, because I teach very broadly and I go into different areas and I blend it and I try to make it relevant to people today. That's just my, my thing, but yeah, go ahead. I, I, I'm trying to get better at this because we're going back. I want to go back and forth with you. I don't want to keep dominating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I, I greatly appreciate it. So no, you're, you're fine. Uh, my other question, which uh, was uh, when we were talking before about that, like post apocalyptic, you know, the decline yeah. of the United States. Um, what do you think, a lot, like moving kind of in the more near future, do you think is going to happen? I know there's been some, so let me preface it this way. Yeah. Uh, I do believe, so I'd like to know whether you believe that we are experiencing kind of somewhat of a color revolution. Um, you know, so maybe the alternative way of putting 
putting that could be, you know, an ideological subversion uh, mm -hmm. from within. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's been talks of that's a very hard thing to come back from. Um, so, you know, when I talk about uh, where we need to go, I, I don't say to make I, I say like restoring America is really what I think needs to happen. Um, mm -hmm. because we feel that that is where we're at. And I know. Kevin, you know, I just want to say Kevin Costner, that was the restored United States of America in the postman. That was the, uh, the name of the, uh, that was that, that was what it was all about rebuilding the United States, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I and I think that's very much where we are right now. We, we mm -hmm. need a restoration, but I'm curious, I guess, uh, again, we'll give you a twofold question. Yeah, uh, what do you think we can, do to restore America now uh, mm -hmm. to come back from that. So three parts. Sorry, I lied. That's right. um, the first one is, do you think that we are experiencing some sort of a color revolution or have experienced it um, Two, how can we come back from that? And then three, do you think some sort of war is in our future, whether that be globally uh, or civil? Um, and or um uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, with regards to the first part of your question, I, I, again, I think that there's some version that goes on to a certain extent. I mean, it's clearly with the media, uh, the media is now, and they're not, they're, you don't have, for the most part, you, and, and we're talking about CNN, MSNBC, all that. These Me. are not, right, the, the MSN, right? We're, we're, we're talking about the fake news. We're talking about um, people that are activists. These journalists are all activists now. I was, I was dumbstruck watching a 90s movie the other night, and I'm sitting there, and I can't believe I, um, Bernard Shaw from CNN was in it, and they, they got him to, to do this little part. I, I remember him. He was an, I thought he was a pretty straightforward reporter. They were just reporting on the news back then, even though they had a liberal bent. Most, most of these guys, they live in New York, so what are you going to do? They're going to have a liberal bent. Well, um, we're also but, human. We're, we can't yeah. involve ourselves with some sort of bias. We're going to follow Absol Absolutely. But you know, you didn't have, you didn't have an Acosta, right? You know, uh, was it, is it his name Acosta? I don't, I can't even, yeah, Jim, yeah, yeah, Jim Acosta, right? I mean, he, he, you can tell, you know how, you know, I, I, I don't pay much attention. I don't follow many people. So that's the funny thing about me. I, I, I follow who I like and, and, and the usually small counts and I don't even pay any attention to what these big guys do. But um, yeah, but I know he's an activist. I've seen him confront the president and other people. These are activists. These these aren't serious journalists. And so I think with regards to uh, subverting the truth, absolutely. Which you, when you saw Silicon Valley jump on board because they understood from four years ago or now five years ago the role they played in helping Donald Trump have a platform outside of the media. He was able to to reach all his people. So they were planning this for years uh, to subvert the truth, right? To actually censor. Uh, the media, they, the biggest, I think, the biggest thing from last year was besides the the fraud in the election, uh, was the cover up of the Hunter Biden story, um, which was clearly uh, a coordinated effort and you know that predicated what was going to come next, which was this literally covering up for the fraud and then shutting down the president. But you know whether they're actually. Um, themselves uh I, I mean whether there's a cabal and whether there's this joint effort frankly i look at biden and i look at the rest of them and i think they're partly shocked that they managed to do this i think when you think about the fact that a year ago at this time uh on march 9th uh you know 2000 and i that's when we record we we're recording this on march 9th but on march 9th 2020 donald trump wasn't going to be president uh no one i don't think really many people that were seriously whether they were right or left uh, you know, thinking if they would would actually say yeah, there was no chance he was going to get reelected or Biden was going to be president. No one would believe that in a heartbeat. Um, so I think COVID, of course, is the is the the culprit in all of this. I don't believe COVID was something that um, was. Uh, I don't think COVID was something that um, uh, was uh, not made in a laboratory. I think that it may have been something that they modified, and and that's my opinion. But I'm not. The point is, it was exported <laughs> and imported by the major Western powers and pretty much the whole world, and it infected us. So I think that that played in. But I don't, you know, as far as a grand plan, if we go back a year ago, year and a half ago, I don't think there was any real plan. So I have this, I'm, I'm sort of nuanced, and my, my jury, as far as me, I'm, the jury's for me is the jury's out. I, I don't really know whether or not. I can really subscribe to that. I do now. The second, I'm sorry. What was the second part to your question? So you, you, you I, I can't if remember. We're experiencing an ideological subversion, and then if we are, then is there 
a way that we can come back from that to yeah, well, I, back. Yeah. Because I, an ideological I, subversion is basically a communist takeover yeah, um, they right. do it without firing. You know, it's a, they do it through the, the culture and through the ideology and through like the media, all these different institutions, which have been, well, you know, infiltrated for, you know, as we were saying, uh, it's been over a hundred years. We, we certainly yeah. saw the Institute for social research in 1923, Columbia university, and then right. they put their way through, you know, the rest of the in universities and through Hollywood and, I think social, I, you know, I think, you know, world socialism was always going to be achieved peaceably. I mean, this idea of, of a worldwide revolution, which pretty much Karl Marx envisioned for different cultures, right, and different societies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, the fact is that it, it started, be, it was first successful, quote unquote, successful, at least in, in accomplishing its goal in third world countries. It's becoming more success, post Cold World, Cold World a cold war world sorry um it's become more successful in the industrial world largely because the again the the soviet union's not there mm -hmm. uh now you know i think when you look at uh what's going on first in academia of course we have clearly we have uh most of the liberals and most of the claptrap that you deal with um, I mean, a lot of these teachers and professors, if they're liberals, they tend to subscribe to some sort of left wing socialist or, or, or cultural Marxist views, which is, you know, and they and they think that that's again, because they don't they never experienced living in a communist country. They're too young to remember the Cold War, the Red Scare and all that. And I say the Red Scare is, I mean, afraid the nuclear war was going to happen. You know, we were building these weapons and I'm not talking about the the uh, the, the Red Scare of the 50s uh, on the McCarthy. But, you know, the uh, now. I would think that, yeah, I'd say that certainly there's probably some infiltration. I think there's generally probably a lot of infiltration, at least, again, academia and Hollywood, the major entertainment industries, Silicon Valley, which is kind of odd. You know, again, these powerful people who made their money in through hypercapitalism uh, subscribe to left wing socialist uh, uh, economic policies for some reason. I, I think well, it's yeah. largely though. It's elitism. Well, that's elitism. They they want to maintain it's elitism. control. It's elitism, but it's also globalism. So these these sure. corporations have global interests, and you know if you're familiar with uh, um, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. So Karl Marx is interesting because you know he wrote the Communist Manifesto, and then he wrote Das Kapital. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually denounced Communist Manifesto, and then wrote Das Kapital as his very in my opinion, feeble attempt at economic theory. But in, do in the Communist Manifesto, he asserted that in order for communism to be successful, it had to be global. There could be no uh, free uh, nation, free entity, free market if communism was... To because it would draw people away from it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it had to be global. And yeah. so these globalists, you know, there's there's slight nuances, just like, you know, fascism mm -hmm. and uh, communism. They have nuances, but they're both totalitarian in nature. And the same thing with globalism and communism. So, yeah. they, so these people who are these big corporations, it's, it, that's why we're seeing the rise of the corporate state, because, and that is a global mm -hmm. uh, entity. So. Yeah, and 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 if and if they actually get their political uh, way, of course, eventually all of society or societies will be basically living on a government-run plantation, and will be subservient to them. It's a return to it's basically a return to serfdom. It's it's a neo-feudalism, if you would even. Uh, you'll be tied to the land, and you'll be dependent on them forever. Well, for instance, I mean the the war against owning your own home or just owning stuff yeah. outright. Most it, like that decline in home ownership over the last uh, decade, uh, something that we used to be part of the American dream, right? Yeah. Um, they make it's becoming increasingly difficult, and there's a des there's a less and less desire for people to do it. So they everything's rented and dependent, whether it's from your telecommunications to your own living quarters on someone else who could take it away just like that. And people aren't saving anymore. People aren't planning. And those that do save have to, we worry the stock market is going to go down. It's going to wipe out their 401ks. So there's a lot of, a lot of concern. The, the thing is that, yes, there, there, there is, and who's going to be, when, who's going to survive this? Well, the people that will survive it are, is the oligarchy. So that's going to be the, 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 the elites, right? The, the, uh, the corporate elites, as you put it, and, uh, and the ones that will be in charge and they'll become the new Politburo. So they'll be the ones in charge. I mean, the proletariat never really runs anything right in a communist society. It's the people never really, 
they never have any rights. They just, they're, they're just, they're just moved around and told where to go and how much to make and what to, how much work to do and all that kind of stuff. So it's, there's no freedom. There's a lack of freedom. And then uh, what was the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you, what was the, the last part of your question? <clears throat> Uh, do we remember anymore? How do we, how do we, what do we do about it? Is that what you're asking? What, me? What, yeah. What do we do about it? And then the last part was, do you think that there is the potential for any type of kinetic war? Cause I, I, if you ask me, I guess I'll ask you, if you were to ask me, I think that we've already experienced certain types of warfare. Um, but in terms of, do you think that there's any kinetic kind of a warfare in our future yeah. globally or civilly? Yeah. Um, of what, what we can do about it, first of all, again, fight back with, I think, parents and, and conservatives in general have to get, and on, we're talking on the local level, have to get involved first in their, well, twofold. I would say, a two, I would take a two-pronged uh, approach to this. I would say, on the one hand, you've got to get involved in your kids' education, or in young people's education, get involved in the school yeah. district, even if you don't have, even if you don't have, right, uh, a child in school. I mean, get involved in the local community education because conservatives, if we're not showing up at these conferences, if we're not making our voices heard, it's it's probably some left, at best, it's some left-wing family that's going to have undue in, influence on that school board. Make sure you vote on those local issues as well, specifically for uh, school boards. You usually those are elected offices. Make sure you you find out if that person is a conservative. If they're not, uh, run for the office yourself. Um, I mean, you know, if you think about it, the founders were a lot of them were farmers. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so they 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 weren't necessarily all like Thomas Jefferson. These polymaths, you know, these brilliant people that had multiple fields of expertise. Uh, I mean, John Adams was a simple farmer. Uh, Samuel Adams, I think, was a farmer too. Uh, he also made good. George beer. Washington was a farmer. Yeah, that's right. George Washington was a was a fa farmer, right? Um, by the way, I was kidding about Sam Adams. In case somebody picked that up, I was kidding. Sam Adams didn't make beer, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Sam Adams. Yeah, sorry, I missed yeah. that. <laughs> no, but you know, um, but yeah, John George Washington was a farmer. In fact, he was the uh, wealthiest president in in American history until a certain man by the name of Donald Trump became president. But um, you know the. <laughs> A lot of people don't know that, but anyways, um, you know. But he, he, by the way, do you know who the poor, quote unquote, the poorest? I hate the lack of a better word. Um, uh, president was in American history. Do you know offhand? Come on. The what? Say that again. Who was who was the poorest? The president who had the least no. amount of money. It was uh, it was uh, Harry Truman. Harry really? Truman. Really? Yeah, it was Harry Truman. Yeah. And so, anyways, um, but um, the uh, the thing is. Uh, you know, I mean, I would say get involved. Then I would say this is, and this leads segues into the next uh, part of my answer. And that is the fact that I would say get involved in your local politics in general. I mean, you know, you definitely want. All politics is local, right? That's right. I mean, that's a, you know, communists were famous for saying that at times. I've heard socialists say that and it's true. What is it? Think globally, act locally. That's a famous socialist. Well, they're really slogan. good at saying things that they know work to their advantage. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, and they're, they're right. We have to be just as aggressive as, as they are. Look, they just, what they just took over, uh, the leadership roles in the Nevada Democrat party. It's they're being open and they're socialist Democrats. I hope the democratic party nationally, the DNC just renames itself the socialist Democrat party of America. It would be, it would be great if they did it. It would create a dichotomy. I do. Uh, one thing I do appreciate is they, they have been more transparent as of recent, but yeah. I wish you'd be fully transparent. You know, yeah. it, like Saul Alinsky uh, talks a lot about like all of their, the rules for radicals and they, they rename everything and they, they usurp language and they do it. You saw it in Nazi Germany. It's a way of brainwashing because if you, if words have no meaning, then that's a way of destabilizing the civilization. Um, True. Society. So I wish they would be more transparent because if people want socialism, then they should be transparent that that's what they want. And that's what they're, that's what they're campaigning on, but not yeah. to hide under a cloak of something else that they think is going to appeal to a wider audience. Yeah, well, and, you know, the Marxism, well, I, I would say communism, socialism in general just appeals to people's nature because people, everybody's greedy, whether, you, whether you're poor, whether you're wealthy, um, everybody wants more. They want whatever they don't have. They want what somebody else has. And so it's it's easily seductive, and that's what it really appeals to. And it repeal, and it also, it preys on people that are, are ignorant. Well, um, and, 
and, and those that are men indoctrinated. Yeah. I, I would just say that, you know, I think in theory, it's really appealing. You know, it's just that in practice, it doesn't work that way because, it's, you know, Marxism is based on a utopia. A utopia literally means nowhere land. Yeah, <laughs> very well. But, hey, you know, you think about what did Ronald Reagan say? He said something like uh, it's only worked in two places in uh, heaven where they don't need it and in hell where they already have it. So, you know, yeah, was, exactly. You know, that's where we're. Uh, but, you know, to, I, I, the, the involvement and the engagement in politics, and this this actually cuts across to a separate topic. And that is actually the, everyone always asks me, what can what, what do we do, Max? What do we do about the, the fraud in this? And I get this all the time. And yeah. I've moved. I've long since moved on from looking at 2020 and trying to relitigate that in my mind, if not in a court. I, I just the, the court cases and all that being dismissed mean nothing to me. It's over. The thing is that if you're wondering how do we fix it, and you have to think forward, and you go, okay, you got to start at the local level. And we're talking specifically in the states where these problems happen. You saw uh, Georgia. I think it was yesterday, or, or I think it was last I did night. See, yeah. They, this morning, I saw they're uh, restructuring their laws to. Yes, yep. they repealed. They repealed at no absentee. They banned basically no absentee. Uh, I mean, sorry, they banned ab, uh, no excuse absentee voting. Right. Which they, which was the the foundation for the vote by mail, which is what caused all the problems that you have in Georgia and together. I mean, they're getting a lot of uh, of of heat from that from the left that are, are are just like falling over themselves to tr to criticize that decision. And it was along a party line vote. The Republicans did it. Mm -hmm. And you know, they also put in, I think, voter ID was one of the things uh, that they. They, they, yes, they, they were going to do voter ID. I don't know if they did. They include that in that bill because I don't I, know. I believe they, they did. I don't quote okay. me on it, but I thought yeah. I saw that they did. I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I can't be certain. I, but yeah, I mean that. I know that was on the table. I remember that was one of the the things they were looking at to to get back to the signature verification. Yeah. Um, that's the thing, and and you got to put pressure on the state legislatures. I remember um, back in the day, uh, back in the day, back in November and December, I was posting all those numbers over and over. People, I don't know how many people you know remember that because I was doing it all the time. But you know, I was putting them out there, and these are all the state legislatures. I would you know have them in Google Docs, people need to just find out. I mean, and if they come from out of state, something I tell people all the time, yeah, you know, if you're from Texas and you, yes, call, if it's, call up the Georgia representatives and the Georgia Republican Party, yes, and tell them because this has to do with federal elections. So it impacts us nationally. It's a national issue. Yeah. Their local election is going to impact us nationally. So nice. yes, you could call up and you've got to tell them where you're from. Sure. But it's like, you know, say, hey, this is the way we're feeling and whatnot. Um, and, you know, and support candidates like uh, Senator Mastriano in, in, in Pennsylvania. I hope he runs for governor uh, mm -hmm. because they're going to one way or the other, they're getting a new governor in two years and, and or actually next year, next November. And right. he would be a great guy to clean up that state the way he led the charge against uh, the corruption during the uh, during the uh, the invest. Well, the quote unquote, the investigations we never had during the post-election uh, uh, period we, we just suffered through. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the fraud period, if you want to call it, right. Um, right. you know, but this is this is its involvement and it's going to be at the local level. Mm -hmm. And that's where it, where it happens. I think you were asking me, too, at one point, um, you know, oh, yeah, you were asking me about, about right, whether there'll be an actual physical war or what will mm -hmm. happen. You know, is that what you were asking me yeah. if in, in, the, in the outcome? Yeah. You know, I, I think, yeah, I do believe I do. I do. Honestly, I don't talk about it much because it's not my thing. I, I stick to my it's not my shtick, if you would. I know Bannon talks right. about a lot. Yeah. You know, Bannon talks a lot about the CCP. And yeah, I think the CCP, essentially the Communist Chinese Party is infiltrating many levels of American society. That's not I'm not ignorant of it. I, I'm very cognizant of it. I think people uh, should be aware of it. I think we should talk more about it. Yep. You know, and. I, I mean, I ask a, per, per, on a personal level, I always ask questions, um, you know, of, of people and, and I and I interrogate, you know, them when it comes when it comes to these these areas, anything that has to do with Chinese dealings and, and, and whatnot, because, you know, the fact is that we know they've stolen our intellectual property. We know that they've they've planted spies in our government. We know our own politicians have had affairs with those spies and gotten away with it. All of this is gone. We know uh, naming we know, names, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we know certain sons of certain presidents have been on the take and 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 have made lots of money and stuff. We know this goes on, yep. and and they're they're very powerful. Now it's interesting because they're the current threat to to I mean, largely speaking, to um, the United States and to more broadly to Western civilization again. 
um, if we go back 30 years ago, or I should say maybe 35 years ago, it was the Soviet Union. Sure. Um, if we're talking about, even then, 35 years ago, you're talking about technological threat, or I should say economic threat, you'd probably be more inclined to say Japan at that time, if you're talking yep. about Asia. Yep. Um, so again, history dictates that you know, a civilizations rise and fall, everything ebbs and flows. So that's how I view it. And so history does repeat itself, but the names change, you know, so that's the real thing. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know whether or not really red, quote unquote, China uh, will actually be uh, the, 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 the superpower that fills the vacuum of a collapse in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it's, there's no uh, uh, profit in the Chinese government, the CCP trying to uh, fight a war with the United States. I think the communist mentality to a certain level is gonna be practical. Uh, what, what, what does it profit them? I mean, you know, if you, if you go to war with the United States, first of all, they make all their money from us. So they need our markets. They need our, our cash. Our IP, they really need our IP. They, 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 they need our IP. They, they need every, they need so much stuff from us. So. You know, a declaration of war, uh, not a dec not an outright declaration. I don't see how that can practically work out. But let's just say an issue with Taiwan, the South China Sea, the waters, Japan gets involved. South Korea is always worried about everything. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, a conflict in, in, in East Asia, which I doubt any American ever wants to go back to that part of the world and fight a war again. We've already had two or three actually in that part of the world, if you count uh, the, the Pacific theater war during the war, World War II. But I mean, I don't think anyone's going to Asia and fight another war again. But, you know, I think that, yeah, I think the, that, that something could happen over there that draws the United States. But what pro they know that. They know the U.S. is going to get involved, or they at least in some way, whether it's logistical or militarily, and it could hurt them. They already saw what one president can do just through executive action. He could cause a trade war that loses them hundreds of billions of dollars over a few years. So, you know, I don't know. I don't really, I think that, and I, and then I don't see, you know, you have to understand as much as we, some people talk about their military strength, they, they don't have the, the Navy we have. So, you know, I, I just, I laugh at that because, I mean, frankly, you know, they have to rely on their massive air force, but uh, they have one aircraft carrier or two, one or two. I can't even, I don't know what it is. I think one. Uh, they just don't, I mean, the firepower the United States has from its combined Navy and Air Force, it's just, I don't see the any power on earth really um, mixing with us. Um, you know, there's there that, but, you know, it, it's, so I don't really, I don't know. I mean, I think that most of the problems we'll probably deal with um, is going to be internally. I think that will. That lead was my to, question. Yeah. Do you see yeah. the internal civil? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think. I think. Look, when you have literally terrorist organizations that are heralded as um, some sort of great civil rights organization. I mean, I'm thinking of Antifa and BLM. When you have them marching with no hesitation through people's communities, burning down businesses, threatening people's lives, beating people up, killing them, killing police officers in some cases, um, you know, and, uh, you know, burning down police stations and the press coverage is nothing to see here, move on. It's something like Baghdad. You might as well get Baghdad Bob. You know, back and, it's totally peaceful. And they're the most violent, peaceful people I've ever seen in my entire life. And, and then you have autonomous zones. That's scary. Because now you're 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 really talking about the local law enforcement ceding authority to some some you know uh, basically domestic terrorists. Yeah, and yeah. the brown and, troops, and yeah. absolutely, and and they're just ceding and they're walking away because you know what for whatever the combination of reasons that are causing them to not want to take even for a Democrat or leftists to not want to control their neighborhoods. Mm. Um, it's just I, something that I mean, 10 years ago, I would have thought you were crazy even during the Obama era. No one's ever that suicidal. I mean, you know, Obama had the beer summit, you know, to make up for saying a nasty thing about a police officer. So, you know, it's uh, yeah, that's uh, that's scary. And they're and they're ceding that authority. Uh, it's right. It's basically I could see tribalism happening internally. Uh, sociopolitically, um, if the United States, if law enforcement start to just say we've had enough, morale is already very low. Um, mm -hmm. There's not once they're gone, once the local police walk away, uh, there leaves a vacuum. There's an increase in crime. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, and so yeah. go ahead. Uh, certainly in the cities, especially we're already yeah, seeing absolutely. Well, that's where it would or the urbanization will, it's, which is already decaying, will then become a hotbed. It's already a hotbed for crime because the more people you shove into an area, the more crime you're going to have. It's just simple <laughs> math. But you know the uh, you know because you have more criminals and you're going to have more crime, and and it's a confined area. But what'll happen is those people will go out and prey on the innocent. And eventually, I thought it was very creative, the autonomous zone, because you actually had, what, these czars, essentially, right? These these gang czars that took over whatever they called themselves. Well, I think one of them in particular I'm thinking of in Portland. And, you know, I mean, I, was it in Portland or was it Minneapolis? I, I don't remember which. I think it was Portland, right? Portland, Chad Cop was in Portland. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you, that's what you'll have. And you'll have more of that on a, on a larger scale. And they'll walk around with AK-47s. And it'll be, look like a, something out of Escape from they're, New York. They're frankly. fine with guns for them. They, oh, yeah. And they had borders, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're really good. They put up They put up walls. They build walls. That's what they do. They build walls to keep out the good guys. It's right. hilarious. It's, it's literally, it looks like escape on a small, kind of like low budget way. It looks like they're trying to shoot Escape from New York. Two or three, because um, you know <laughs> we're Snake Plissken. But you know that's the the that's the uh, uh, that's what you're you're, you're exp I think what we would experience if if things continue to slide. And you know we talk about secession. You you think about there's the, all these movements to for states yeah. to pull out. There is no mechanism for that. People often ask me about that. Is there? Yeah. There's no even in the Texas Constitution, it doesn't really say that. What what I think people, um, but what may happen is if you had a a a, a cadre, if you would, of states from Florida to Texas, right. uh, which are basically, that's more than half of the U.S. economy, in a sense, coming from there. And they say, you know what, we're just going to do a tax revolt. We're going to, we're not, we're not, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to comply. You already have local sheriffs starting to say this in liberal states, right? Democrats say, we're not going to enforce any federal gun confiscation legislation. So right. you start having that more and more, but why not? They let the genie out of the, out of the bottle already, the Democrats. Right. That's when they refuse to enforce so many laws, whether it's from, from election laws, right, all the way uh, uh, to just go back to last summer uh, to the riots, to so just their own civil laws and, 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 and protect people's businesses, they, they had police stand down. So, you know, I mean, yeah, you could have a, a resistance, a sort of like a, in a, a, should I say, an aggressive version of what you saw in India in the 1940s uh, under Gandhi, um, the 30s and 40s, where it was just this peaceful resistance, not an outright war. But if that happened in the- Civil the disobedience, US, yeah. Civil disobedience, exactly. And if you do that enough, you could basically force them to the bargaining table. That's a step uh, that could actually happen too. And I think that that can lead to some sort of a um, a, 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 dis, uh, a disassociation that would, or a disunion of the states, which I don't advocate because I, 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 I I'm, a, I'm a unionist, so I believe in keep I believe in going through the democratic quote unquote little d process and and people voting, but again go back circle back to it. It all gets down to us cleaning up our elections and and fixing yeah. the irregularities. So, do you think there is much potential for that, especially now with HR one, you know, being pushed forward? How, what what do you think the chances of us? returning to some semblance of fair and you know honest elections are i think that um i think h1 uh, hr1 will uh will fail uh, i still believe that i hope i'm right i hope you can come back to this and cite this and yeah i know i i, I think it will fail i mean there's like a 10 percent chance maybe it can pass in the senate but frankly i know they're i know they float these ideas that the so bernie sanders my concern yeah. i'm sorry to interrupt you my concern okay. is actually i i do agree with you in the short term but what I see them do so often is these push these really outlandish things. And usually they don't pass in the House or the Senate, but this time it's actually passed in the House. But they push these things, you know, they present them and then they keep pushing it under the, you know, under the table. So even though it may not pass right now, I, I'm concerned that it, it's almost like you make you put something forth that's so outlandish like you said you know some of these things five years ago we would have just thought you're absolutely crazy but they mm -hmm. put these things forth so you become a little desensitized and it becomes easier down the road to actually get it passed and that's my concern with something like hr1 but 
I, I am concerned about election integrity as a whole, but HR1, I, I happen to agree with you. I'm hoping, <laughs> really hope that yeah. it doesn't pass through. I don't think the chances are, you know, th that it will. I think that, you know, it won't this time around, but I don't know go moving forward because I, I see that as a pattern. Yeah, I think that when you uh, look, they, 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 again, the left are more aggressive. They're better at what they do. They're better organized in many ways. Um, and they do try to keep pushing legislation. That's why I said it was a trial balloon. They keep putting it up. Now, just so you know, the House did pass a bill very similar to H.R. 1 about a year and a half, two years ago, and the Republican Senate just tabled it. Um, you know, the fact is that uh, well, for, let's talk about, this is something that I know this concerns a lot, this concerning a lot of people right now, yeah. and they think it's just going to get through budget reconciliation because, and there's a lot of misunderstanding. Look, to pass anything in the Senate except budget issues, specifically money issues, okay, money legislation, and, it, and even within that, it's limited. Uh, you need 60 votes. Uh, they don't have 60 votes. I'm just going to say that right now. Not one Republican voted for it in the House, not one Republican in the Senate is going to vote for it. I would say in the Senate, you probably have a more conservative caucus on this issue than you do in the House, more unified conservative caucus. Uh, this issue is toxic uh, to the GOP. They're never going to go. They're never going to support it. Any Republican that stands there and votes for it uh, is going to be ostracized within the party in in Congress. So they're just they're not going to go near. That's why not one House Republican voted for it. Um, the uh, not not just because of the practice. Uh, effect it's going to have in which it's going to we know it's going to create a perpetual democrat supermajority forever and that's the end of 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 the united states the the uh and whether that actually happens this idea of a, of a permanent a democrat i've been there's books going back to that to the to the 1990s I mean, actually further back you can go back to the 70s the emerging democrat majority and it just never happens because uh demographics our destiny they say quote unquote yes but but if the elections are if we don't have you know election integrity yeah you can you could do fraud and openly you could just you could just pick up votes right and you manufacture mm -hmm. votes yeah that's that's why they're well they're looking look democrats aren't stupid again i think in a lot of cases they're more rational and smart than us some of the people on the inside anyways they're thinking through things right they, that's how the socialists are taking over local parties mm -hmm. and the fact is, and we're sleeping through it in in these states uh, I, I mean i don't know where the resistance is the conservative resistance is to that but um they 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 looking at uh the demographics they're looking at latino voters they're seeing how trump who was just out there right he he didn't he you knew what he was thinking you well you didn't know what he was thinking but you know how he felt about issues and so he and he's been labeled every kind of name under the which i don't he was not he a racist didn't mince words. We'll, we'll just he didn't mince words yeah he didn't mince words and yet he he does tremendous with latinos i mean i forget he didn't do 32 percent. he got about 35 to 38 percent of the latino vote if we're being honest and so you know second only to george w bush in 2004 and that was a different time, frankly. So here's Trump coming out with his strong rhetoric. Look what he did in Florida. I mean, he basically in Florida levels, you know, four or five percent victory is like a landslide in Florida. I know. I know. And so, you know, I mean, the uh, the fact is that, you know, Donald Trump, he got so close. I mean, the idea that he lost Miami-Dade by, I think, less than 10 points. I mean, come on, that's like a landslide for a Republican. And so, you know, this is why one one of the, that's just one example of one of the reasons why Biden uh, lost the state uh, in an honest election. Uh, and that was because he was driving the Latino vote. There are a lot of Latinos, a lot of Hispanics out there from different cross sections, largely Venezuelan um, and uh, and Cuban, but yep. also other groups. Uh, and he did better probably with Mexicans. This, yeah. this, this is a man who really... Just and then, of course, the African American vote. We know he increased that. Everybody admits that. Even in D.C., he doubled his vote in D.C., yeah. um, and that was driven partly by the his increase in, in the in African American uh, voting share. Totally. So this is a this is a guy who's. That's why I often say he's one of the most racially sensitive presidents. One of the reasons, uh, you know, he the presidents we've ever had, and uh, he's he's a really. Uh, I mean, he's a really he, he's very sensitive to that, and he knows how to appeal. And he's and he's using universal language too. He's doing it through what everybody, every, no matter who we are. It's not a racist issue. It's not a black or white issue. Security, law and order, security economics jobs right oh it's very simple language that's what everybody wants right yeah <laughs> yeah just very simple and you know it's not what bathroom you're using and it's not with uh, you know it's not you know um you know i don't want to get into all of that 
achievement, <laughs> but it's not these other issues. Um, it's like, you know, because, hey, the best economic, the best answer for, you know, um, unemployment is a job, right? And a good paying job at that. And that's what he was after. And that solves a lot of people's problems, sort of universal. Um, but, I, you know, so the, uh, the, you know, as far as um, HR1 goes, I think with regards to that, um, people need to write off to your audience and everybody just remember they need 60 votes to pass it. You're not going to get one Republican vote. I don't know if they have every Democrat on board for that. I would not be surprised if uh, I'm, I'm Joe Manchin, I know he speaks out of three, four, five sides of his mouth. I, on the bottom line is I don't think he votes for it uh, as a standalone bill. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's political suicide for him. And he knows that he barely got reelected uh, two years ago. He'd basically be done politically if he starts going down the Schumer road. I know he's under tremendous pressure to Ben. I think he should yeah. just leave the Democratic Party and, 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 and become a traitor, basically, and a political traitor and become a Republican. I think it would save him and his career, make a deal with Mitch McConnell. But, um, you know, I, I, but I, they, they simply don't have the 10 votes. And so they need those, even if they get every Democrat on board. Um, we know Kristen Simina is sort of a maverick. Uh, she kind of wants to inherit that John McCain uh, mantle. She may or may not vote for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't be surprised at the end of the day if the Democrats have, are short by at least 12 votes. Now, can they use budget reconciliation for it? I know Bernie, I think Bernie Sanders said that the other day. Look, um, I, and I, I could be wrong. It may not have been him. Look, it, it can't be done. It's not going to be done. You could say it's an economic issue. The parliamentarian is going to rule against it. And a lot of people don't understand the process in the Senate. The parliamentarian has to make judgment calls as to what can be added to uh, the the uh, the budget rec or can, what can be passed under simple budget budget reconciliation rules, which takes fifty one votes. Um, the parliamentarian is not an elected official. Uh, they tend. They, they tend to, the current one, I believe, is a Republican, but be that as it may, they're supposed to be nonpartisan, really. But be that as it may, uh, the fact is that he, she's, he or she is simply not going to, they, they, they just shot down the $15 minimum wage, which we could make a rational argument has something to do with economics. So, mm -hmm. and a, it's on when it comes to voting, no way. They're just not going to do it. Now, you, now uh, the presiding officer, which is technically the vice president, the president of the Senate, she can override. You you can override. Yep. I don't know if the president pro temp can do it, but I know the, the vice president can override the parliamentarian. Um, however, at that point, uh, if you do that, what you're essentially doing is you have to make an option. If you want to kill the filibuster all, outright. I was going to ask immediately, about that. Yeah, the filibuster. Immediately, that's what you have to do. You have to kill the filibuster because Which you they're can't. They're trying. That, that yes. They're trying to do that. Okay, but the problem with killing the filibuster is they need 51 votes to do that. You immediately lose Manchin and you immediately lose Kristen Semina, who simply, she's a person that in that case, I she will never compromise that. Look, she's in an awkward state. She's in Arizona. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a state that is slowly becoming more Democrat, but again, people don't understand this about Arizona. It was a very heavily Democrat state. They don't, a lot of people probably don't know about Arizona. Arizona was actually a Confederate territory during the civil war. So it has a very strong Democrat, uh, um, uh, base to it. There's a, there's a strong sense there, especially in the Phoenix area. So, you know, it, it's like, yes, but at the other hand, there's, there's still a heavy Republican and now more ever MAGA uh, group of people, uh, you know, uh, voters voting block there. So, you know, it, it's something where she's got, and I think personally, she understands that, look, she's thinking long term and so is Joe Manchin. In two years, we could be in the minority. So what would happen if the Republicans take both houses of Congress in 2022 and just start shoving legislation with no, no filibuster to stop it? Now, we know that Biden will be vetoing it. But he only has two more years left on his term. So, you know, and he's only a one term president, in my opinion, because I don't think he'll run for reelection. But, um, you know, I think it's going to be an open race in 2024, separate conversation. But so, I mean, they, 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 so I think some I think people like Manchin and, and, and Simona, maybe someone else will be thinking a little long term. I think also, too, you got to remember, there are a lot of Democrats up for reelection in 2022 that don't want to necessarily kill off the filibuster pass voting reform that's going to get. Uh, they may be in, in, in Trump states, I think. I'm not certain. You know, I haven't looked at the roster very closely lately. So, but yeah, I just, I think there's a lot against it. Can it happen? 
Yeah, they could kill the fil- they have to kill the filibuster to do it. You, they'd have to have Manchin and Simona on board, 51, 50 votes plus the vice president. They kill the filibuster, but that's it. Once they do that, there's no going back. If the Republicans ever get control of Congress again in the White House, there's no nothing to stop any legislation. They could pass whatever they want. And, you know, I mean, they killed the filibuster for uh, the federal judiciary for the Supreme Court. What did that lead to? That led to Trump stacking the courts. So, you know. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. What do you think are some of the biggest, uh, the I, I guess the most dangerous uh, policies that are being put forth now? Uh, I think the voting, I think HR1 is one of them, of course. I think, um, you know, socioculturally, I would say there's not really many policies. If they're, they're mostly, everything's been executive orders, executive fiat, which is meaningless. It's a joke, right? So, you know, I, I guess this, ep- this emphasis on, uh, you know, getting involved in people's sexuality and their, you know, their, their, their gender identity and stuff is unnecessary, undue amount of attention being paid to these issues that should be left up to families and, and local officials and local communities to make a decision. If I'm using the PC political, uh, you know, response to it, um, I think it's just stupidity, frankly, if I'm being quite honest. I mean, what, I don't know what we're all talking about here. Um, you know, I tend to be a realist and, a, you know, so I don't, I think these issues here just, uh, make, I, I think they just make us look weird, frankly, on, on in front of the world. But I, that's just my opinion. Um, there are more, they, 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 they follow the Marxist blueprint that that's really, sure. what it is. you know, they well, it's, it's all about cultural Marxism. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And and that's what it's about dividing people and, and trying to you know, break everyone down, you know, and that's fine. Every, you know, I, again, I believe in breaking everybody down and, and studying their, um, their in, in subgroups, which is as an archaeologist, what you do and anthropologists do that. Uh, but, you know, it's like when you apply it to politics and it's like, why are you going out of your way to divide people? And I can't believe how divided people are 20 years after 9-11. I just shake my head and it's just I, I, I just I, I can't believe it. And, you know, it's been a succession of presidents that have been divisionary. So it's, I, I'm using my own word there, um, you know, from Bush to o- Obama, I, who I think did the most damage. I think Bush set up the stage with his endless wars. And, yeah. and then Obama came in and was just basically re- Obama was a reverse racist. So, you know, that he just had, I think he just played up uh, all sides uh, just to get his ag- agenda across, which yeah. I'm glad which a lot of it didn't pass. I, I, Reverse racism is like some weird term. It's like, I, I wouldn't even say it's an oxymoron because it just doesn't have any meaning. It, it's still racist. Like, it is racist. The, the only, definition the only, of racism doesn't apply to like a sync specific race, you know? Like, oh, I agree. And I, that's a good way of looking at it. I remember uh, Rush using the term uh, in the past. So that's why I picked it up as a kid. You know, he would always yeah, he would say sure. that periodically. I, I understand racism. it. I just wanted yeah. to point out the absurdity of it. It's like. It, it is. <laughs> it's just racism, right? It's yeah. just anytime the people talking about race are the ones that are usually the racists. So, I mean, they're the ones that once are pointing out all the racism are usually the right because they're the ones that are always seeing the world through a prism of color. And, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I'm like, why do you why are you why are you reducing everyone to their skin color and their gender now or their gender yeah. identity? I don't understand why they do that. I don't care. I don't care if you're a white woman or if you're if you're a black man or if you're a Latino or, you know, I mean, I just don't care. It, and, and I, and I, I'm up kind of like, this is, this is like an old school st- streak from my childhood, but you remember don't ask, don't tell. I mean, you know, it's sort of like, I just, I don't really, why do you have to tell me about what goes on in your bed? I'm sorry. I don't know if this is the age of your audience, but um, wh- why do you have to tell me what goes on in your bedroom? I don't want to know. I mean, why does that have to be a li- put on a label well, next I to your name? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, but heterosexual couples don't, don't go and, Per, you know, tell us yeah. what's going on in there, but so why? Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, and it's just like I think you said. It's just these are political movements. This yeah. is what it's like. It's like COVID nineteen, and I believe it's a disease. It's a disease. I just think the that flu it's is a, a disease too. By the way, so is the cold. It, I'm sorry. Say that again. Say that. I didn't hear the flu person. is a disease. By yes, the way. right. You know, right. we have so, lots of diseases, and people actually die of the flu. Although we, we cured the flu, 22, yeah. we cured the flu, so. Yeah, of course. You know, no, I, what I mean is, I was going to say that it's, a, in, this is the difference between the flu, though, and COVID. The flu is just a, a disease. Mm-hmm. COVID is a political disease. Yes. It's been politicized. So that's the thing. It's a political disease. So it's being treated differently. I mean, because when you think about it, well, 
You're right. I call COVID, sorry, I call COVID the communist virus disease. Well, you know what? It, it, it is true because it, or it, it came from that part of the world. And I do believe, and this is just me, and this is as far as I'll go with a conspiracy theory. I don't think it's a conspiracy theory, frankly. There was too much. What happened to the people that were researching it? What happened to, the, the, to, the, uh, uh, to some doctors who disappeared that, that had a knowledge of it? They disappeared, right? We know this is a communist country. People wake up. It's a totalitarian state. They're human rights abusers. Why don't... That is general common knowledge. Everyone knows about it. I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. They lie. They per- I mean, look, at, remember during the whole height of the crisis when there was constantly this... Um, they had those maps up of the COVID crisis. You could go online and see them of everybody dying or getting sick of COVID. China was stuck. I don't know if anybody remembers that. China was stuck on a certain number for weeks and weeks and yeah. weeks. They simply weren't reporting. They weren't reporting all the cases. I mean, people, they, they lie. They're propagandists. Uh, this is what a communist country does. It's what the Soviet Union did. Yep. And so, you know. And Nazi like, Germany did. Absolutely. Nazi Germany. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, it, it's something where you look at that and then, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, could it have been developed in, in or could they have taken an existing virus and and cha- and, and, and altered it, it in it some is, way? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a hey, listen, it's not science fiction. That stuff can go and you can weaponize um, common biological organisms. That's what's called biological warfare. So, yeah. you know, it's it's there's a whole field of, of study into that. And and it's a whole military wing as well. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, that sort of happens. I mean, but this is, again, um, you know, these. Uh, uh, but it's a political disease and it's a convenient political it helped the Democrats. I mean, I believe if that hadn't happened for certain, there would have been no vote by mail. There would have been no reason for it. These states would have never have adopted it. States like Georgia, Arizona, Republican states like that never wouldn't have given any permission for it. That wouldn't have happened. I think that the turnout would have been down. Uh, and I see turnout down. Turnout would have been about the same. Only thing is you wouldn't have had. Uh, you know, Joe Biden getting these exuberant numbers, you know, he did better than with certain groups of people that in certain parts of the country uh, than than Barack Obama did at, at the peak of his popularity in 2008, which is an absolutely impossible. It's just not not it's not, not impossible. Possible. It's just highly improbable. Yeah. So, you know, it's no, no, Joe Biden. You know, you know so this would have been I think Trump would have won in a hand. I look, Trump got seven, at least 75 million votes. In my opinion, it was clearly he was heading towards landslide slide territory. And I don't get into the whole thing where he would have won California too, and everything. People get like, a little crazy, but you know, I think he look at in New York. He did. He well, got about I will 40. tell you, they made it legal to cheat in California with the ballot harvesting. So that's that's true. You know, California is interesting, right? So there's that state there. They have that that jungle primary, which I think is ridiculous. Yep. And then they uh, then they also have you know motor voter, right? That was the first. I think that was one of the first states that ever did it. Uh, so yeah, and then they have ballot harvesting now. That was something new they added, and then the endless counting and stuff. So sure, you can inflate the number. I mean, look, if we're ever we go back to 2016 and past elections, I would say California probably had the higher level of illegal voting um, out of most of the states. They just have a larger population, but it, you know, and it's probably coming mostly from Los Angeles, uh, specifically. And San Francisco, yeah, yeah, into yes, yeah, to a lesser degree, San Francisco, absolutely, yeah. So that's where all that, all that's coming from. That's where the corruption is too. And needless to say, those are some of the, especially LA is one of the worst, it's one of the worst cities crime wise. So you know, um, in in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, rivals New York in any ways. Well, New York, you know, New York's New York now, not during Rudy's era, you know, it was, it's bad a few years ago. But yeah, that reminds me, I was going to say a minute ago too, the president actually got 43% of the vote, I think it was in New York. So, you know, he was in the 30s in 16. So yeah, I mean, this is a guy who was doing better across the board. And he was definitely, for him to win Florida, Texas, Ohio, by a landslide in Ohio, uh, and Iowa, and not win the general election, no, come on. The probability it's never happened before. Oh, the bellwether counties. Yeah. No, no it's never <laughs> happened before. That's no. why I, I don't bother going into it and talking about, it's just not my thing. And I know this is like, like toxic for, for YouTube and stuff, but um, I just don't talk about these things. This is, I'm well, this is all like, you know what we, I know this already. It's, you know, and we've had, we've had controversial, uh, elections. Everyone, look, the 1960 election was an election that was controversial that a lot of historians believe was stolen. Tried to stop uh, Lincoln from getting his second term using mail-in ballots. Uh, say, say that last, I'm sorry, say the first part of that. Uh, they tried to uh, impede Lincoln from getting his second term 
by through mail-in ballots. Through, yeah, through mail-in ballots. Yeah, you know the thing. Yeah, you, you just these things. Not happen. news. <laughs> no, it's it, it, it's you know uh, there is always an element of fraud. It's just the, the magnitude of it, the size of it. I don't believe there was widespread fraud. I think that that is a misnomer. I think it was tactical, strategically done in certain cities, and that's the end of it. I think that's that's they had they knew which cities they had to target. They targeted them: Milwaukee, uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Phoenix. Uh, pretty much the whole state of Nevada, and you know, I mean, Los Las Vegas and whatnot. That's they just knew which where to go. They didn't have to go throughout the whole state, and that's why I thought when people went around saying, "Oh, widespread fraud," and I'm like, "No, it wasn't widespread fraud. It was tactical, strategic. It was in different areas." And uh, the, you know, eventually, um, I believe, you know, if you get the right people in there, they can reform those areas. Um, and and that's we, again, we've had a look. There've been there've been corruption in cities, and there've been uh, attempts at stealing elections and, and many times in U.S. history going all the way back. We had, I think, eight, I think 1796 was the first controversial election. That was because it was, it was, uh, it was, it was basically, <laughs> it was, you had John Adams win and you had Thomas Jefferson as the, as the, as the runner up come in as the vice president. And, uh, and, and there were a lot of unhappy electors and a lot of unhappy bureaucrats and, 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 you know, whatnot. So, uh, then the 1800 election was of course, it's a contingent election. So, uh, when Jefferson won, uh, that wasn't even decided by the, 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 the electoral college, it was decided by, uh, the house of representatives. And that's what made that election very controversial. So, you know, there's going right back to our founding, we've had issues with our election system. So and I talk a lot about this in the seminar. So, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. So, well, this has been awesome. Would you have anything else you want to add? Definitely tell everybody about your seminars, which are awesome. And I will just say, from my personal experience, one of the things I do love is the Socratic method because I feel like that's very much lost. I think that people, children today in the education system, are really taught what to think, not how to think. And I think that that method engages people so they're forced to start to ask questions and start to you know think about the material in ways that you know they otherwise wouldn't if they're just being spoon-fed uh, yeah, so, yeah yeah exactly yeah well you know i um i just uh, you know what i do uh besides everything else is i've noticed that there because there are so many people out there that don't have an, uh, a general knowledge even a basic knowledge and it's not their fault it's the education system and it's also their jobs and their constraints it's a combination of things i mean i was like i mean you know i've gotten i'm involved in it now because i kind of grew up in the environment but it, it's i'm always learning new things and i had to go back even during this last election and do a lot of research specifically on what on the electoral college i had to dig deeper in that because i knew it was going to come down to that but i wanted to understand all of the, the little intricacies and all of the little ceremonies that were invested in it and what what you know the precedents for it so you know i do teach um i have taught uh american history uh before but i teach civics to adults uh and i and i actually not to, taught it in school anymore <laughs> It isn't taught in school anymore, right? So I actually do uh, do, um, and I, I do this online, largely private uh, tutoring and, and teaching for um, for for people on civics. And I started these seminars, and uh, you know, so what I the first one I did I think was in in January, and you attend. Oh, you actually I think you did you attend the first one or the you attended the first one, right? I think was yeah, it the, I think the first yeah. one. Yeah, so you attended the first one. So I do that and I call it Civics Maximus, which I thought was funny. It came to me one day when I was trying to figure out what to call it. Civics Maximus. I added the 101, Civics 101 or Civics Maximus 101. And uh, it's basic. It, it's two to three days, depending on the month. I usually do. I'm starting to just get into a rhythm of doing them every other month. And um, people are welcome to contact me um, at Maximus underscore and then the number four. And then it's EVR on Twitter. And I'm um, also on a uh, parlor um, at Maximus, the number four EVR, no underscore. I'm on, I'm on Gab too. I don't log in as often as I should, but the same as my Twitter handle um, at Maximus, the underscore, uh, the number four EVR. And they can contact me. They can DM me directly and, and talk to me about it. And I have a lot of people show up for them. So I'm doing those. Um, and we go through, you know, uh, democracy versus Republic. That's another, it's a short kind of like subtitle to it. We, basically spent a lot of time throughout the entire two to three days, depending on the month, talking about um, Socratically interrogating the history of and the 
the different aspects uh, or characteristics of uh, both a democracy and a republic. Uh, and I do this comparative contrasting analysis between everybody, with, between the two different, um, with everybody, be between the two different uh, political systems. And then, of course, great because, um, sorry to interject, but it's great because, yeah. you know, the left loves to say that we're a democracy and our democracy needs to be preserved. And that's not really accurate. We are a democratic republic or a constitutional republic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's because, you know, there's, these are, again, two different systems. And again, it's just, it's easy to say it. And, you know, uh, I, we, we talk about that. We talk about the fact, what is a democracy? And, and, and you know, the, and again, I go back to classical Athens and we go right down. And, and within, with regards to that, we always have to add context. I mean, what, what were the people like that, that, that adopted this system? They, oligarchy was there and they had tyranny. And we go through all these other systems. And I mean, we come right down to the present day. Um, you know, discussing, okay, the practical application of this, that the, we, we spend um, a good deal of the second uh, or third day uh, discussing election reform and the history of elections in the United States. We talk about the Bill of Rights. We talk about um, the 14th Amendment, which I often include with the Bill of Rights because so much changed with the adoption of the 14th Amendment. All, all against the backdrop of American history um, and, you know, of the, in the, the founding fathers and who these uh, men and women were. And then, of course, the political parties. What is it to be a Republican or a Democrat? So this is, uh, civic, you know, Civics Maximus is a really good seminar. I highly recommend it to anyone that has, a, a, you know, questions or wants to learn more. It's sort of like a... It's sort of like a crash course. And then that is something else I do too. I do do random crash courses. I'm starting to get into a, like an off month with those. Um, what I'm doing is I did a bunch last month and I'll do some next month mm -hmm. and people can hire, basically they can contact me and reach out to me to, to if they want to just do like a two or three hour crash course on civics, we can do that. Um, the uh, the uh, other thing is uh, I have my next uh, seminar, and, and just so you know, your audience knows the next one is actually going to be March 26th to the 27th. That's the next time we're doing civics. Uh, so it'll be Friday and Saturday on the 26th and the 27th of this month. Uh, and then next month we're doing my big, uh, this will be the first time I'm covering this topic. Uh, this is going to be for those history lovers out there. Uh, three days, April 22nd to the 24th will be a, um, a seminar on uh, basically medieval seminar. It'll be on a, a, a topic I like to talk about. And it, I'm calling it Knight, or I should say Samurai, samurai versus Knight, uh, the life of, of a medieval warrior. And we'll be talking about the codes of Bushido and the code of shimmel, chivalry. Mm -hmm. And we'll be putting this to the backdrop of Buddhism and Christianity. And it will be this, con this constant yin yang, if you would, back and forth but over three days uh, between the civil, the, the, basically the lifestyle and the environment, the so, social and economic environment of the people. Um, we'll be talking about their their ph philosophical beliefs, their arts and architecture, and we'll be talking about their warfare, their weapons, and their combat, the martial arts, uh, and comparing, uh, you know, essentially medieval knighthood with bushido. And and I think I, I it's, it's going to be very fascinating so if anyone's interested in in, in t attending that they can as well i know i'm hoping you come too because i know you've been there for all my so you've been, you've been making all my seminars so i hope you actually uh, you're invited oh, i have yeah <laughs> hopefully i will be that that sounds right up my alley something i would really enjoy so hopefully i will be able to yeah and please I, do we'll I, talk more about that too yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> Not a one on one. So, yeah. but, anyways, so, yeah. So, it's, but hey, thanks for having me. This has been um, very fun. And, uh, and this has been really good. This has been a really good debate. And we got to do it again sometime. If you have me back on your show, I, and I hope, I hope, you know, I really am happy. Congratulations on the show. I know you've had, you had the, uh, editor of the uh of the of the gateway pundit on the other day as i remember i did right? i did that's cool how did you get him on that how did you how did you land him he posted um, it was on his on his website right he put the whole he did he did yeah. yeah so i i have some mutual friends um yeah and so cool. you know that's cool congratulations i'm glad you did i'm waiting you know you have to get bannon on your show and you got to have him come on i would love that that would be amazing <laughs> gotta get dad Got to get dad on your show. As I call him dad all the time. You're right. So we'll, we'll just <laughs> explain that you call Steve Ben your dad. Yeah. Yeah. I do that. I do that. I, I do that as a joke. It was an online joke because he reminds me of my dad, at least politically. And so, you know, I say that on my podcast sometimes. And I said, yeah, dad, quote unquote, you know, and I always qualify. He's not my dad. Um, but uh, I did that. It was like a, it was like a internet rumor. I started that is because I, I was watching his show every day 
in, 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 you know, during the election crisis. And um, I would just say things he said, and people would start going, yeah, you know, who are you? And I said, and then I said, and then I just started one day just saying, oh, dad said this. And they're like, what, who, what? And that's how that began as a joke. So, so I, I thought you meant your dad when you kept saying dad, dad. Like, <laughs> no, and I, people? and I did, I, 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 I follow. <laughs> yeah, people, people, you know, people uh, believe things so quickly. So I had to follow up within a short time with, Oh, and I just, I would just qualify it. And I stopped doing it after I was like, he's not my dad. Okay. You know, he's just like, it's not, it's just, he looks like dad up there. And I think it was some people actually saying to me something about, you know, his hair and this and that. And they were like, you know, and I, and I, somebody was mentioning their dads and that's how I, I just came up with it one night as a joke. But anyways, I dropped it after a while, but yeah, you got to get him on your show one time. It'd be great if he was to actually show up on your show. So. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. I, I love him. Yeah. That would be really awesome. So yeah, Jim was incredible. He, he's such a nice guy and yeah. obviously, you know, wealth of information. He was fantastic. So there's, there's the gateway pun. There's a group that have really been on the front lines, uh, going after all this corruption. So, you know, yep. that's really awesome. That's really they're, awesome. They're not backing down, you know, that it's nope. true journalistic integrity. So I have yeah. tremendous respect. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. So. But anyways, it's been great. And, uh, you know, um, you have a, take care of yourself and yeah. keep uh, plugging along. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And I should have said this in the beginning, uh, you know, I'll put a little note, but thank you so much for coming on. And, you know, we, we put the picture to respect your privacy. So I appreciate that you're willing to at least have your voice be here with us today. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself now. Yeah.